Our third speaker is Salman Hamid. Uh, he is Assistant Professor of Integrated Science and Humanities at Hampshire College, and he will be talking about the religious framing of Darwin and evolution in Pakistan. Thanks, Laura. I decided that uh, to rile things up a little and to present uh, arguments which disagree with both of the previous uh, speakers to a certain degree, not too much. But I thought, hey, why not? Let's, let, let's see, I mean, like, you know, to take a different stance. Um, so I'm going with a slightly more optimistic outlook uh, regarding what's happening in the Islamic world regarding evolution and, and more importantly, more towards the future. So one of the things that Uwe also mentioned about the narrative of creation stories in the Quran, there are particulars within the Islamic creationism or uh, Islamic case, um, its, its interaction with evolution that may suggest that, uh, that, that, that there is hope regarding this. One of the things is that generally, unlike the book of Genesis, for example, where uh, the creation account is laid out very, uh, at one place very clearly, in the Quran, generally, their details are not there and often it is presented in some other context. And so, for example, even with uh, the creation, so here is, um, here is a quote from the Quran, surely your Lord is Allah who created the heavens and the earth in six periods of time, and he is firm in power. So again, the six days is mentioned, but it is in the context of other, uh, other aspects. Even the length of days, so Islam in the Quran, you do have six days of creation, but, but the length of days is ambiguous. So length of days, and again, this is uh, from 32.5 and also 74. So one is, in a day, the measure of which is a thousand years of what you count. And in another place, in 74, it says, a day, the measure of which is 50,000 years. Okay, so it is, to, uh, to, uh, to one way to look at that is, it is clear that if you are looking for age of the earth, it is very clear that you cannot find it in the Quran because the days are directly ambiguous. At one place it's 10,000, and one place uh, it's, it's 50,000, and, it, and the word is just like, no, no maybe it's 10,000, maybe it's 50,000. It 50, the result of that is the younger creationism, the idea that you have a 6,000 or 10,000 year old earth is completely absent in the Muslim world. Now, that's a that has two consequences. One is, for the U.S. version, the young earth creationism, if you believe, if you start believing that, if your starting point is that the, you have a young earth, then the idea of evolution becomes absurd. If you first believe that the earth is young, then sure enough, all the evidence for evolution doesn't have enough time to, to come about. So it's a very logical conclusion you will reach, that evolution is false. But if you have old earth, and this is what has happened in many ways, is that when the, when the Quran is ambiguous about it, where do you look for answers? And what, for many, what many Muslims have done is that they have taken and, and they have looked for answers for science, from science. And so an old earth, four and a half billion year old earth, is completely fine. In fact, from cosmology perspective, uh, Big Bang uh, is accepted. In fact, Big Bang comes up as a sort of like supportive um, idea regarding that. But what about biological creation? Well, as Uva mentioned, so I'm not going to uh, go through the details, but that even the biological creation is not that clear. It's like how man was created, and it, there are still ambiguities about that. What was the material, uh, the details about that? Again, but the creation account is not as isolated, just like the way as it is in the book of Genesis. So there is no single verse that you can isolate that unambiguously challenges evolution. So thus, unlike Bible or, or Christian creationists, the Quran does not end up playing such a central role for Muslims in the debate over evolution. That does not mean that the Quran doesn't come up. People do use the Quran, but it do, no, normally there are other aspects that play a role. Either it is, oh, look, it's bad science. They have missing fossils, borrowed arguments from creationists. But Quran itself plays a secondary role uh, on many occasions. But there, is, there are other things that are happening over there, and that is the context in which evolution is being brought up. 
And there is widespread recognition that science is essential and that there is no tension between Islam and science. And that is going back to some of the things that Perez said about how you react to modern science. So, so, but this was a particular reaction that is coming out of 19th century reaction to colonialism. Muslims were behind. And it was like, OK, well, but it was clear that science is essential. And so this narrative, and, and one of the persons who was responsible for narrative uh, was uh, Jamal al-Din Afghani, whose name came up earlier also, he said, well, Islam is actually a very scientific religion. And through it, you, you see, you, you, you go much further in which they say, well, all of the scientific discoveries are also in the Quran. But that argument exists like, you know, that, well, Islam is a very modern religion, it's a very scientific religion, and Islam and science are compatible. And that, in fact, gives sort of like, if you ask people over there, is Islam compatible with modern science? You actually get the answer without people thinking. There is a reflex section. Of course it is. And, and, and in fact, uh, here's a plug for Tainer, uh, Tainer's book here, like, you know, about the illusion of harmony. And he talks about partly this illusion that Islam and science are in complete harmony. But that narrative does exist uh, in the Quran. So you have this harmony going on. But this harmony does not get challenged when you're talking about the Big Bang Theory, possibly. But it does get challenged with evolution. But evolution itself has other things that are going uh, in a larger context. First of all, evolution is an imported idea for Muslims, just like most of modern science. But for many, evolution is associated with its secular values and westernization, and thus is seen as a threat to traditional Muslim culture. So here is this interesting thing that on the one hand, there is a standard narrative that, well, Islam and science are compatible, but evolution makes it a little bit problematic. And that's where it, it provides a nice, uh, you can think a marker, you can think about a nice probe to think about how Muslims then associate a modern science with. And one of the first Muslims, again, uh, scholars to reject evolution was Jamal al-Din Afghani, even though he was one of the people who actually promoted the idea of Islam and science harmony. And here is a quote from him, there was, is, uh, there was, is, and will be no ruler in the world but science. And he attributed the decline of Islamic civilizations to the neglect of science and philosophy. And yet, he rejected evolution. But he rejected evolution in response to Sayyid Ahmad Khan, as, uh, as Professor Glick had mentioned uh, earlier in the morning. And he was, an Afghani was connecting this to the idea of materialists. But he was responding to a particular colonial context, and I won't go into that. But let's move on how people have respond, responded to it in more modern contemporary times. Well, not really contemporary, but uh, in the 20th century. So here is Iqbal. He's considered as the national poet of Pakistan. And he was unhappy with evolution. Uh, but he reluctantly accepted it. But when he accepted it, he credited the idea to ninth century philosopher Jahiz for the idea of evolution, and another scholar, Ibn Muskawi, in the 11th century, as the first Muslim thinker to give a clear, and in many respects, a thoroughly modern theory of the origin of man. So Iqbal not only accepted evolution, but he also accepted human evolution. He didn't like the idea, he brought up the issue of soul in it. But rest of it, he related in the idea. But when he accepted it, he put it that, well, this was an idea that was given by Muslims in the beginning. With. The same strategy was employed by Jamal al-Din Afghani. Initially, Afghani rejected evolution. But later in his life, he changed his mind and accepted it. But when he accepted it, he called Darwin a mere specimen collector. He said that he was simply discovering the same things that Muslims had discovered before. So here is something where the context becomes important. Because if it is coming in the colonial context, and there is anti-colonial movements also going on, and there is almost an embarrassment of borrowing, having to borrow science, for example, from the West, when you change the narrative to say, well, this is not really borrowing. This is actually repossession then you have appropriated 
Darwin, and it makes it easier to accept. By the way, this is not simply uh, a Muslim uh, context. Uh, John William Draper, whose name comes up in the warfare thesis of science and religion and uh, who created this particular narrative and who had a book, uh, History of the Conflict Between uh, Religion and Science in the 19th Century, which was pretty harsh uh, by, uh, with uh, the Catholic Church in particular. But it was quite positive about Muslims. And in fact, he said the same thing what Iqbal is saying. So this is, he's writing in the, in, in, the, in the 19th century, Draper, and he says, thus our modern doctrines of evolution and development were taught in their schools, and their schools, he's, he means Muslim schools, earlier on. In fact, they carried them much further, much farther than we are disposed to do, extending them even to inorganic or mineral things. So this is, uh, this is Draper in the history of the conflict between religion and science. So, so here, Draper is using the Muslim example against Darwin at all. He says, well, yeah, well, Christians are behind here, but evolution, actually, the idea of evolution was given by early Muslim scholars. The same kind of framing happens even today. So evolution is included, for example, in textbooks in Pakistan. And we are going to hear more about uh, evolution tomorrow in, in textbooks. But here is a biology textbook from, uh, from Pakistan, 12th grade biology textbook. And here's a chapter on evolution, and it presents evolution as a fact of science. And it actually talks about creationism. It says, like, you know, well, uh, like, you know, that oh, previous, previously people used to think about creation, and that's where the concept of evolution versus special creation, and it rejects special creation. Now, the epigraph of that chapter, right up on top, you have a verse from the Quran, and it says, and he is who had produced from you from a single being. Now, a lot of the debates in the U.S. has been about the separation of church and state. So this would be something that would be no way it can make it into the textbooks. But in Pakistan, that is completely non-existent. And so here is a case where evolution is being presented. By the way, the text itself, the rest of the chapter, has no reference to religion at all. It's just that epigraph up on top. The, the book textbook itself starts with Quranic verses, and that's a framework that it is being presented. But rest of the book is, uh, the chapter doesn't have any Quranic references. Sure enough, the chapter following it is on ecology. The chapter following it is on biotechnology. Human evolution is simply ignored. It's not that it comes out against, like, you know, that no, human evolution is wrong. Human evolution is simply not presented. It's not discussed. As tomorrow we are going to hear about, but of course teachers step in and they pres they provide an alternative creationist uh, story. And Anila is going to talk about that. But from the science perspective, that's what is included in textbooks, but it is included in a religious context. And so far, it hasn't generated too much controversy. It hasn't been taken out. Of course, human evolution is not included, so that's a, that qualification is important. And here is uh, a university. A bio, this is just uh, an example. Uh, this is a university in Balochistan. And over there, I was, uh, they were, I was looking at their website, and they actually had a seminar also on evolution. But, uh, but they have a course on evolution. And this is Balochistan, so this is not Karachi or Lahore or Islamabad. We are talking about much more remote area. So this is biotechnology and informatics major at Balochistan University of Information Technology, Engineering, and Management. They include evolution. Again, no human evolution, but evolution is, is a course is included in there. Is there opposition to evolution? Absolutely. And, and, and here are three scholars. Uh, I like this easy top picture. But, uh, but, but, he, uh, but I'm not going to talk about all three of them. Uh, but, but I have other slides. I mean, if you want, I mean, I can, I can talk about it. I'm actually going to more focus on uh, Madhudi. In fact, I'll just mention it. Religious scholars do have opposition uh, to evolution. But as Uwe mentioned, a lot of the opposition comes down to scientific objections. They say, and, and those are borrowed in the same way. You have missing, fossil, uh, m m missing fossils, uh, fossil gaps. You, you have like, uh, a similar type of the, the ones that creationists make. So here is Madhudi from his Tafim talking about Darwin. And he's very clear. He says, it is very difficult for us to understand the exact nature of the creation of the first man. So first of all, I mean, he is making the claim like, no, but it is very difficult to find out about the first man. However, it is quite clear that the story of man's creation, as stated in the Quran, is quite different from Darwinism. 
very clear-cut opposition to Darwin. He is putting it against the Quran. The Quran says that man started his life as man, that in the entire history he has absolutely no connection whatsoever with any non-human state. Allah created him as man from the very first day of his life on the earth. Very clear opposition to uh, Darwin and, and here our evolution he is putting them uh, putting Darwin and evolution on the opposite ends of the spectrum now he goes over it for two pages I agree he goes over it and he talks about like you know and he brings up all the scientific uh, pseudoscientific evidences about like you know um, uh, fossil gaps and things like that and then he has towards the end this paragraph it says the most that can be said in this connection regarding the creation is that both the theory of, uh, theories of the creation of the species may be equally possible. Their creation might have taken place according to the Darwinian theory of evolution, or each of the species might have been brought into existence individually. You go like, whoa, 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 whoa. You had just put everything against Darwin for two pages. But then you have it, well, but it's equally possible that both of these theories may be correct either the Darwinian one, that God may have worked through Darwinian processes, or the creation one. And, and there lies, I think, this is an instructive thing of how many people think. Evolution is not a central point from a theological perspective. Science is respected. And here is a loophole that says, by the way, evolution is completely wrong, Darwin is completely wrong, and just in case if he's right, but God worked through him. So here is a loophole. You, there is a loophole that is being provided, and Maududi is highly influential. And when we are talking about Maududi, we are talking about to the right of the spectrum in terms of we're not talking about sort of more liberal ideas. He is very conservative. He's very influential. But, but the loophole is in his theme. So overall, when these religious scholars uh, talk about biological evolution. Usually, there are uh, there's widespread mis misunderstandings about what evolution is. They talk about the latter, uh, like you know that how come we still have apes, for example, if we evolve from the apes and things like that. But yet, they also have Islam and science harmony because they are still using science to show that Darwin is wrong or evolution is wrong. They're still using that. Opposition is usually centered not on the young earth aspects, not on other aspects, but usually centered on the change of species, that species are actually fixed. And that is related to the fact that Quran mentions species in there, and if Quran is timeless, then long time ago species must not have changed. If those species that Quran mentions long time ago they were something else, then how is that possible? So that usually the opposition comes uh, from there. And then, of course, the moral implications of the common descent, that if humans are connected to animals, then, well, our morals are connected to animals, and then we lose morality. There is no basis of morality if we are connected to. So there is no real discussion of what if biological evolution is correct, except for Madhudi, who said, like, no, well, um, uh, then it, God must have worked through that. So instead, focus on just a theory or on missing things. So... In the last section of the talk, I will just talk quickly about fragmented authority. The question is that, do the opinions of religious scholars really matter? Who gets to shape the debate? Again, because of the Sunni Islam, there is no pope-like central authority. You have religious scholars vying for interpretation. But the educated class, as we were talking about, that a lot of these religious scholars have been educated in, um, in their madrasas or in schools, which they don't actually encounter science, uh, modern science in a proper way. So you have another middle class coming up. You have an educated middle class coming up. You have doctors. You have biologists. Who, you have physicists, for example. Well, they are also different. They say, we understand science better. You have a different class. So does this, and, and, and to make things more complicated, the professional class of scientists themselves is from the 19th century. Pretty much for, for, for the Muslims, the issues of authority, these debates, that, the authority debates that have been going on for 1,400 years, well, it adds a whole new element to it when you have a professional class of scientists in there. So who gets to shape, who gets to decide whether evolution is, uh, is compatible with the Quran or not? Should, should religious scholars even matter? So here is a quick thing about ulama versus ulama. This is uh, inspired by spy versus spy. 
from Mad Magazine. But anyway, uh, so here is a picture. So th this is the issue of, of moon sighting. Now, here is a matter. So every year we have Ramadan, and the end of Ramadan is through looking at the moon. And the issue is whether people should look at it or people should use calculations for moon sighting. So in Pakistan, there is a committee that, uh, that, that decides it. And the committee mostly is made up of religious scholars. There is one representative from uh, the meteorological department who do, cal do calculations. And so this is the head of the committee. By the way, this is, from, uh, this is from a little bit earlier. And they were not using telescopes. And I'll tell you in a second, it's a theodolite type thing. And as an astronomer, by the way, this, this seeing the moon and not using calculations particularly hurts deeply. So here is a cell phone. I like the cell phone picture also. And like, you know, they're looking through the theodolite. They're trying to see the moon, if the moon is there or not. Now, uh, in 2002, the meteorological department actually did announce. They said, well, like, you know, the moon is going to be on so-and-so date. And so the head of the, uh, the committee, he declared, it is not the job of the Met Office to make an announcement as to when moon of an Islamic calendar would be visible. Okay. So now here is an issue where it's saying, whoa, 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 predictions. You can make predictions, but, but it's not the, 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 this is not the responsibility of the Met Office to make that announcement of an Islamic calendar. So here is an issue which is clearly being put into Religious context. Well, this year they've started using telescopes. Woohoo! For astronomers. Uh, here is a uh, telescope because in Saudi Arabia, actually, there was a ruling that, yes, well, you can use telescopes. And so there has been another controversy this year. And, uh, and this year, what happened was in Peshawar, uh, they always start the month of Ramadan a day earlier than the rest of Pakistan. They don't follow the authority. And so they end up uh, celebrating Eid a day before. And the, what, so what I'm trying to say is that they see the moon a little before than everybody else sees it in Pakistan. So this time, they wanted to have a joint Eid. They said, OK, all of the countries should have one day of Eid. And so the, the council, they were invited to Peshawar. The problem was that was the 28th day of the Ramadan. And the Ramadan can only be 29 or 30 days. That means on the 28th day, you simply cannot have the moon. And the, so the person in Peshawar said that, no, 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 they should come and see the moon, because who knows? But when he was asked the question, OK, fine, but do you believe in science? Do you accept science? This was his reply. Even though he wants people to come, even though there is no moon scientifically, he says, when he was asked, but do you accept science? He says, how can you say that anyone living in this day and age would reject the importance of science and astronomy? And yet he is calling people to go over there and look at the moon, even though calculations say there is no moon. Okay. So, I will, so this is just an example. And what, where I'm going with this example is the issue of evolution will be decided based on who is going to shape the evolution debate. If this is an issue of science, then Scientists will get to decide, or, or, or non-ulama are going to get to decide. But if this becomes a religious matter, which is happening in the moon debate, then the ulama are going to shape the debate. Now, the meteorological person, by the way, in the office, still talks about uh, the calculations and things like that. And there is pressure coming up. The reason why the moon controversy is coming up because there's a pressure from globalization, because you need to know when end of Ramadan is where there's going to be a holiday. There needs to be more stability. There's educated class coming up. They said, well, we can do calculations. Why don't we use calculations? But this is where we are at. So evolution debate, I think, and that's where my optimistic assessment comes in, purely from pragmatic purposes, the use of biology is going to become more prevalent. And slowly, it's going to push aside the religious scholars. And even with religious scholars like Maududi, because they have left a loophole, people will find a way to do that. But when they will do it, more likely than not, it's going to be in a religious context, not without it. And I will stop here.